Hi, and welcome to Just Share, a fun podcast. This is now the second episode, I believe, that we've had here. I'm Josiah Clements, and uh, with me, as always, is my co-host, uh, Caitlin Foss. And we are just exploring the minds of experts in their fields. And we specifically have a, a goal of decreasing barriers to learn more about ourselves, about the world around us, about our relationships with others, uh, and of course, our, our professions. And so each week here, we're going to have a guest or two on to share their thoughts uh, in their specific fields and also just exploring their brains as well uh, with the goals of decreasing barriers, sparking curiosity, and just uh, general tips for learning more in life. And so with me today, uh, I have Dr. Caitlin Foss, uh, who is a professional from the city of Columbus. So thank you for being here today. Thanks, Josiah. We're taking turns. I interviewed you last week, and now you're interviewing yes. me the for this Experience. week's episode. Both, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, so just to start things off, um, I'd just like to hear a bit more about your background. Can you tell us, um, you know, where you grew up, uh, what, you're, what you're doing now, and uh, just some of the things uh, in your current role that you enjoy doing? Yeah. So I grew up west of Dayton, which does exist out in the cornfield. <laughs> I heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Ohio. And so I also went to Kent State for undergrad, which was about three hours from home. And mm. then after that, I pursued a graduate degree, a PhD in human development and family sciences, wow. which took me to Virginia Tech. And okay. Then I became a professor of developmental psychology and outside of Washington, D.C. Wow. So I was out of Ohio for 13 right, years. Right. What did you say? I just said, right. You know, that's uh, a long time to be away from Ohio, but now you're back. <laughs> and then I had the opportunity to come home because I stopped being a professor on purpose. I left the academy after earning tenure, after becoming a department chair which within that system, that is a job that you have for the rest of your life, basically. Yeah. And yeah. I knew it wasn't the right fit for me anymore. And so when I started working for myself in 2020, then I realized that I had the opportunity to come home to Ohio. So I've been mm -hmm. here over two years now. And okay. the root or the thread of my whole life, all the different positions I've had over time and expertise is in human development. Mm. And so growing up and uh, working on issues, studying parent-child relationships, uh, I participated in the foster care system as a foster mm. mom for four mm. years, I think it was, in that system for about wow. five years. And now I do a lot of motivational speaking, leading workshops, uh, I have a new contract as a grants coordinator for the Columbus Urban League. So wow. I'm happy to be working with them. So a lot of nonprofit and policy institutes and childcare uh, has been, have been threads in recent years, especially with coaching. I, right, right. That's the other thing in there, <laughs> threading this <laughs> <Life> together. <coaching. laughs> yeah. So over 4,000 hours at this point, coaching people one-on-one. -on -one. My goodness. And that's been a lot of leaders. And so hospital right. administrators, doctors, and other professors. Uh, and then like later today, I give a talk. I'll be coaching actually new life coaches who are being trained. So I've a coaches coach. new <laughs> coaches. Yes. <laughs> that's amazing. That's really incredible. Thank you for, for sharing all that. Sounds like yeah, like you said, there's a couple of really deep threads there that are, are important to you, both in, in advocating uh, for healthy human development, but also in maybe raising up uh, either the next generation or helping those currently in leadership positions uh, learn more about themselves and how they can best work within their professions. Uh, so I, I really appreciate you sharing about that. My first question, I guess, is uh, back to, um, you know, what perhaps made you uh, want to leave your, your position uh, in, uh, you know, in Virginia Beach, or Virginia Tech, I should say, and, um, you know, maybe some of the thought process that went into that, you know, being being a pod where we're, we're trying to get inside people's people's brains, you know, that, that couldn't have been an easy decision, like a lot of ways. So just curious, um, you know, about uh, what led up to that, um, you know, maybe some of your, your your internal conversations you were having with yourself at the time. Oh, yeah. So I 
uh, I'm 37 now. And at the time, well, let me say I went straight through school and I wanted to be a teacher since I was five. And I Mm -hmm. thought I'd be a high school family consumer science teacher at like home Mm -hmm. ec. And I love (laughs) teaching always. And so I I knew that. And that's always been true. That's still true. true, And yet some of the decisions that I made in my early 20s, if I look back on it now, were foreclosed as a term we'll use of it didn't include a lot of exploration. So to be able to become a professor at the age of 27 by right. 27, you're making decisions quickly. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Fast and furious. <laughs> and then the brain's not even fully developed yet. And so I made big career decisions without mm. that much exploration, a very fast pace, very driven, very high achiever. Like, I want to get to the top. Right. So when I'm faced at, like, at, that, at a turning point, uh, often a for a lot of uh, emerging adulthood is 18 right. to 25 years old. Yep. And then after that, for a lot of people, they can experience a crisis. Yep. And I did. And so it was a mm-hmm. perfect storm of I'm having my identity crisis of like, who am I as I approach 30? Right. And my university, we were having like some systematic issues that really yeah. threw me off of my game of understanding like, wait, this system isn't everything all joyful and wonderful and optimistic as I thought right, right. it was. Sunshine and roses. Yeah. <laughs> Disillusion. Sure any system I see now. Sure. And yet sure. at the time, that's like the one I grew up in, the one I was trained in. I had a lot of um, high hopes for being able to go in and change academia. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> it's a very slow moving system. It is. Uh, it is. Yeah. And I didn't. You know, it was like, wait, I don't quite fit here. So I knew in 2016 that I was starting to have issues with Mm -hmm. it. Like, okay, this is my crisis. This is like, do I still want to stay here? And I kept working through that to then leave in 2020. I said, started coaching at the time. And so it wasn't all at once. All at once. It was slow. I was making life decisions too. So I was married at the time. And then mm-hmm. we became foster parents. So I also mm-hmm. had other people in mind to consider oh, for sure. yeah. beyond myself and what I wanted for the future. Yeah, and that's a really good way of, of stating as well. And I really liked, especially what you said, you know, at the beginning, um, you know, they, that 18 to 25, uh, you know, brain cycle, we'll, we'll call it, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot going on in there. And there's, there's oftentimes a lot of, you know, societal or, or family pressure um, or just expectations you have of yourself. Uh, you said it. Very well, you know, you're you're pretty young and idealistic, you know, at the time, and so you're, you're like, all right, these are the things that are going to happen, and this is how my life is going to be. And then, as life usually, you know, does, it, it throws you curveballs. Um, so, just really interested to, uh, you know, hear more uh, about that for sure. Thank you for for sharing, um, you know, your your kind of process at the time. Um, so, my next question then is uh, moving over towards. Um, your, uh, your coaching side of things. You mentioned uh, earlier that that's uh, one of your, your current passions. Um, you love uh, just uh, teaching others. Uh, and specifically, you know, I, I know very little myself about the, uh, you know, the life coaching uh, worlds and, uh, you know, that side of things. So could you just explain uh, a little bit more to us um, what some of your favorite things about that sphere are, as well as some things that, um, you know, people might not know as much about? Mm, yeah. I think often people have examples of coaching and other domains where they have seen it paid off, pay off for themselves. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was from a coach in athletics, uh, younger or older or whatever, but Mm -hmm. someone was there to guide you or facilitate Mm -hmm. your process Mm -hmm. as you were experimenting and failing. And so, um, Okay, so it could be in a sport. Some people are more exposed to career coaches now. Right, so right, they sure. see, like at work, okay, here's the issues I'm working on. Do I have a mentor or a guide so that as I work on issues, they steer me in a way that recognizes I don't know what my what the next best question is. Right, right. So over in life coaching, it's very similar in terms of, okay, what issue are you bumping into in life? So 
often my clients were talking about any and every domain, no, even though maybe they thought they were coming to me about career or they're right. in a big transition. <laughs> they think over. they come with one thing. It ends up being like, oh, okay. So because I've coached a lot of people and have a lot of training and all of this, right. I can see some pitfalls to avoid and like help steer in a direction to say, well, what about this? When I like that. Actually, what if you, for a lot of people, it's the processing of emotions that they have mm. been outrunning for yeah. decades. Yeah. <laughs> because we get trained to be brains on a stick. Mm. And I needed to learn that myself too, of running around <laughs> like a brain on a stick. So how do we integrate the whole body? How do we integrate our emotions so we can still show up professionally and we get to show up as like the person we wanted to be when we were young? Yes. Really integrated, yeah. embodied, like passionate. I really alive. like that. I'm sorry. What was that last? A alive. Can we alive. be alive? Sometimes we just kind of slowly yeah. start to die off into a really gray zone of just what am I doing every day? Man, that's that's really powerful to, you know, kind of sit and think about it and really really one of the the goals i think when we when we started uh you know this pod it really fits well within um you know what we've what we've stated that we we want to uh take maybe those those gray areas or those areas where, where people are um you know maybe uh, being those uh, brains on a stick <laughs> like you like you said and and really integrating that into what it truly means to to be a human to be fully processing those emotions, you know, that you've talked about and uh, allowing ourselves to not maybe be so, you know, using a, maybe, maybe a software term here to be, be so siloed from each other, um, which is, you know, I have my own expertise, you know, expertise in my own field that I'm working in. Uh, you know, this is how I think things should be. And there's not a lot of bleeding in or carrying over from, from other fields. And so um, I really like uh, everything you just said about uh, learning to be fully human. Like that's, that's the fantastic goal for you to uh, have as, as you're teaching others and as you're coaching. So thank you for, uh, thank you for sharing about that. The next uh, question I have, and maybe getting a little bit, uh, zooming out a little bit more from, from career specific focuses, um, but just, uh, you know, advice in general, like what's, what's some of the best advice you have ever personally received, whether that's from, uh, you know, a mentor or, or a camp counselor or somebody else that had one of those, you know, points in life that you're, you're talking about uh, be, being a coach or being there for you. What's some, some good advice that, that you've received that you really think others, uh, others should know about? Mm, yeah. So I have a really great one-to-one -one facilitator that inspires me to continue to grow as a coach, facilitator, mm. teacher, et cetera. Mm. They embody what they're teaching, which mm. is less about the words. And so when you use the word advice, actually at this right. point, it really feels like if I'm listening to someone, can I hear mm -hmm. behind their words mm -hmm. what their experience is and where they're coming from? So are they mm. coming just from their head and trying to give me expertise advice? Right, right. Sometimes <laughs> I need that. Like I literally yeah, sure. have a project, I need that cerebral piece yeah and yet for life like I have spent a lot of time looking around of who's living the life that I want mm. which turned out to be like the people that are my mentors now we actually live very different lives and we come yeah. from very different backgrounds yeah. and like it doesn't yeah. look like oh okay they have a house and they got married and they did all these things right those are very mm. like external yeah. Yes, things. Workers and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So now it's like, wait, they seem to be, you know, I started paying attention to people who are very centered, calm, mm. Mm. not thrown off when stress happens. <laughs> in their life. Uh, could also hold their own of emotions. And so sometimes when we're going through something, we might, even without realizing it, try to put it on someone else. Right, right. To deflect yeah. And so being around people that have learned how to hold their own has been inspirational. And then like, wow, yeah. how, okay, how, what is it? Like, how, what's that process? I need to <laughs> lean into that. So I guess yeah. my so-called advice here would be pay attention to who's around you. Do mm. you want their life and how mm. they act? 
because if you don't, whatever words are coming out of their mouth, you probably don't want to listen to, or I don't want to listen to. That's coming right. from a different place. Like, no, no thanks. Absolutely. No, I really, I really like that because, um, you know, especially at the beginning when you're talking about not just listening to the words that people say, but really getting at, you know, what's behind their words. You're absolutely right that uh, far too often we're just like, oh, I'm, you're, you're either regurgitating information or, or it comes from a place of, you know, uh, brain on a stick perhaps. Uh, but, you know, getting really at what people are meaning either behind their words or, or seeing like the deeper repercussions of, of how they live their lives and not, um, you know, not either just repeating slogans back and forth uh, or, uh, you know, running around a bit aimlessly, but really focusing on how do I want my life to live and even if or how to be lived. And even if somebody is, uh, you know, ha has a different background, like you said, but is still calm and centered uh, when, you know, faced with a crisis, for example, how can you embody some of those practices? And maybe they never said anything directly to you, but you can just observe. And it sounds like you're really in a good place of observing from the mentors around you, uh, sometimes even when they when they don't speak. Um, so thanks for for drawing that advice question out a little a little bit deeper. I like that. Yeah, if I can add to it, I'd say yeah. something. Well, one, I'm a big generational person that. I often give talks about bridging generational divides. Yes, and yes. one of the things that I will say to people is like also a, a looking at two people who may be not further, so to call further along than you, but can yep. be someone to learn from in different domains. Yep. So all that to say, Josiah, you're someone to me who embodies the, um, the, the ability to understand and hold grief in a way mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. gave me a learning perspective. Like I learned from you when mm -hmm. we got to know each other in 2022. Yes. I think when yep. we met that summer, working out yep. and we're having a casual conversation and something in me felt safe enough to tell you that I had just lost my ex-husband a couple mm -hmm. months before. Right. Right. And I kind of kept it. I still sometimes keep it close yeah. and guarded. Yeah. And, and some yet walls. something in me. So I say that to you and your reaction to that was so crystal clear to me that you got it, which you mm. shared part of last week. Why? And like we expanded those conversations yes. over time, but it yes. was it's in moments. It's just a moment in a workout that somebody mm. gets you and then you mm. like, <laughs> you know, now I'm trained to, to pay attention to that. Like if I'm present in the moment and I have one of those moments with somebody, I, I'm like, wait, like, let me keep yes. into that. And when maybe before, especially being a brain on a stick, that would have felt vulnerable <laughs> and I would have shut down and be yeah, like, like oh, I can't talk to that person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I'd forgotten about that uh, conversation, but yes, you're, you're absolutely right. And, uh, I think, you know, yeah, some of the, you know, not to give, you know, a full NP plug here, but part of the group, you know, that we're, we're a part of, it does encourage that, you know, in, intentionality and the place where conversations, you know, can, can flourish. And so that, that particular time you, you being, you know, vulnerable. And I think you even said, if I recall correctly at the beginning of the conversation, you're like, well, this might be a little bit vulnerable, but, and I said something to the effect of like, no, please, please do share. I appreciate it when people are vulnerable and I, I want to be, you know, safe for that kind of conversation, you know, so we, we each got to talk a little bit about the, the losses, you know, that we'd, um, you know, experienced, um, you know, then even afterwards, you're like, is it all right? You know, if, if I give you a hug, it feels like this would be like a hug appropriate time is what I remember. And so just like being open to those kinds of, uh, you know, conversations and just uh, directing them in a way that's uh, safe and vulnerable. Like it's, it's a tricky line to walk for sure. Um, but you've certainly been somebody that has, um, you know, inspired me very much as well to continue being open, to continue turning towards, um, you know, others, but then also allowing um, you know, others to, you know, take care of me, um, you know, and, and my emotional state when I need it, which is something that that doesn't come naturally to me either. So um, I, I appreciate you uh, exploring the question a little deeper, as always. Thank you. So uh, a couple more questions uh, here that I have for you, uh, specifically as we're referring to uh, barriers and um, some of the ways 
uh, that, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of either, you know, shows or, or popular culture, you know, out there uh, about, you know, how, how to life coach or how to, you know, self-improve others, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, those come with, you know, opportunity or time or, or, or a money cost, but what are some things that some of our, you know, either our listeners or friends uh, can start doing today just to uh, whether attune themselves to, to others around them or to decrease the barriers in their own lives uh, to learning? Mm, yeah. Okay. So the first thing that arises is that for me, my meditation practice has been what's made that flourish. Mm. So how can I be that more receptive? How am I going to actually decrease barriers? So before I very much lived a life, hamster on this another metaphor, <laughs> hamster on the <laughs> wheel, right? I love a good metaphor. Love a good metaphor. Yes, you do. <laughs> run, run, run. And so then I was seeking advice in this really like fast paced, go, go, go. I just need to know the next step. If somebody just gives me like five tips and I'm going to follow those five tips. Yeah. Well, I did that for a long time. And what's funny about that also is that eventually you just keep reading the same things. Like when you yeah. really study self-improvement right. and yep. the idea of it, it repeats itself a lot. <laughs> and then you're That's like, just... <laughs> hmm, you know, and so somebody right now is very much like, oh gosh, she's going on about meditation. Here we go. Like <laughs> I hear this everywhere no. and I'm not no. doing it. You know, I'm just going to tune out <laughs> or whatever. And it was in the slowing down, mm. actually practicing a meditation which involved mm -hmm. finding a teacher that I really liked. And then also because I am who I am, I then needed to train to be a meditation teacher and I have that yes, certification of course, of course. and I, <laughs> I love to host uh, in-person events, especially with meditation. So it was through that, that then I'm able to show up in meetings, able to listen. So it's not mm -hmm. just when I sit for my formal practice, it's right, now right. I'm in meetings I was just thinking about this the other day. I was in a meeting and I was just resting in awareness while my new boss was talking to me about the work to be done. Mm -hmm. And the younger me would have in that hamster wheel would have been maybe bored, let's say, in the conversation yeah. of like, yeah. oh man, this is a boring conversation, blah, blah, right, blah. Right. Mm -hmm. And like I'm going to jump ahead in my head and I'm just going to stay in my head and I'm not present with that person then. Mm. I'm missing things. I'm agitating my body. Like all of that was just mm -hmm. torture a little bit. It's probably part of why I needed to leave my position as a professor right. because I couldn't find a way to make peace with that. Yeah. <laughs> kind of meetings so and right. So my... The meditation practice has really helped me then show up in the rest of my life centered. Uh, and, and I mean, people associate it with calmness and stability. And I think it's the ability to process emotions as they arise. Yes. Yes. Just sitting there and, and, and thinking things over and, and sitting with that emotion perhaps rather than, Oh no, you know, this, this has come up, you know, I, I better distract or, or, or disengage or, or, or tune out for myself. Um, you know, in, in many of the ways that society uh, perhaps, you know, tells us to, uh, you know, quickly uh, separate yourself from anything that feels uncomfortable. A lot of the times, no, like we, we, we do need to just sit in that and while it might not feel good at the time, uh, you'll you'll feel better in the long run as you're familiar with feelings that do that do come up. Um, so yeah, a hundred percent agree with that. Now I did not go willingly. I should also add is that <laughs> I had to get desperate of like not Honestly. being able to feel my body, feeling <laughs> ill, feeling uh, burnout at work, feeling yes. like very stressed out. Like critical moments kind of made me then surrender. And like life said, okay, you actually, are you actually ready to feel <laughs> uncomfortable? And I was like, yes, like, okay, fine. All right. I can't take it anymore. Thanks. So it's things like that that got me there. And I like to think, I like to believe that I lean, I'm surrendering, surrendering more often now so that I can show up and be present in oh, yeah. whatever life is presenting. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And it's, I mean, you know, you're talking about old, old practices, um, you know, or things that have been repeated often that are, are, are valuable, you know, such as meditation, but it's also, you know, sayings like, 
practice makes perfect. You know, people aren't aren't joking. You know, when 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 they say that, you know, doing something repeatedly over and over again. Uh, you know, whether that's uh, public speaking, whether that's uh, you know, um, you know, just uh, you know, being somebody that's looking at every day, you know, small challenges, like how how can I challenge myself in small ways? We are, I think tempted, you know, speaking on my own behalf, I'm, I'm tempted to look for a, a shortcut often or, Hey, how, what's something that will, will take me the most amount of steps in the least amount of time. And, uh, I think too few of us, myself included, look for the small step that's going to take us to the next step, you know, and then the next week that's going to take us to the next step up after that. And it, it can't all be, you know, jumped at the same time. All the, all the steps can't be, um, you know, skipped or you don't learn, like your brain doesn't perhaps learn uh, you know, all the all the patience that's required to go along with that process. Um, you know, you, you don't want to you know re retrain your brain in a way that maybe is 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 unhelpful. So um, I really appreciate you just bringing your perspective to bear on meditation specifically. Certainly, something that you know I I wish I was more you know um, uh, you know disciplined about. But the times that I have engaged in, it's probably a once or twice a week basis right now you just feel so much more uh calm for whether that's going in for a big presentation at work whether that is um you know just having you know, a generally stressful or anxious day uh just just doing it um you know it's one of those things at the beginning i'm like oh, i don't know if i have time for it. And then afterwards i'm like ah oh, i'm so i'm so glad i did uh so thank you for sharing about that for sure definitely uh, perhaps future sessions will have to dive in more to to some of the advantages of meditation for sure all right, moving on here. I think the last uh, official question that I have for right now before we get to our usual uh, list of 10 or so uh, rapid fire questions at the end. Um, what is a way uh, that you have um, or your field has changed recently? And um, what is a, a way to state that to our, to our listeners uh, that will help them understand maybe what's coming next? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question that clearly I had not reviewed before we had this. <laughs> Just so the listener is clear. Uh, the spot, yes. <laughs> I think if I think about the field of studying lifespan development, so birth yep. to death and what's in between, something that's emerging right now, like we studied, we have studied children extensively. And in a lot of cultures, we know how to raise children in a lot of clear mm -hmm. ways. And we have structures and society is set up for it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of gaps and holes. And yet, there's still a process for people to grow up. <laughs> yes. And where is that process? So the field right now, I think, is leaning into what about these in-betweens of, mm, let's say, especially 40 to 60. So mm -hmm. after 60, we'll also study it in depth, especially from a healthcare sure. perspective sure. and what happens with aging and as we get closer to death and all that. But mm -hmm. the in-between has been, well, one, it's pretty new on the scene. So mm -hmm. there have not been hundreds and hundreds of years to study people, <laughs> 60 to 80. Right. Or, well, 60 to 80, but then if you're going to live until 80, at average age, well, what happens between 40 to 60? So my lifespan yep. textbook used that I assigned to my college students used to just lump 40 to 60 together as just one big yeah. like middle yep. adulthood. Work, yeah. <laughs> you know what happens then? You like, yeah, like you you uh, level up at work and you raise children mm -hmm. is how it was just basically summarized. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody's listening that's like, 45 they know that they feel very different than a 55 year old and a 60 yeah, year old for and sure. so the opportunity there is what does it mean in those ages what can it look like how can that age group guide the next generation mm. and balance it in ways that we're not fighting each other or being like you don't know what you're talking about because things have changed so much. Right, right, right. Like right. we don't want to recreate the teenage parent <laughs> dynamic again. Next. Yeah, for 50 sure. 50 to 30. Yeah. Uh, so the opportunities are there. Or what I'm most excited about, of course, especially because as I get closer to 40, uh, I'm always studying what is on the horizon and yeah. have been around 
people who are older in my whole mm-hmm. life, always like surrounding myself with multiple generations is important to yeah. me. Yeah, no, I, I really like, you know, everything you just said, but especially uh, with you just uh, talking about your passion in, in cross-generational development and how we can learn from the, from the different cohorts, but also that not all the cohorts, you know, let's say, you know, you have millennials versus, um, you know, boomers versus and just different sections of, of the populace. And that within each of those cohorts, everyone is very different. You know, a lot of, you know, uh, what is it? 45 to 60 now uh, is, is Gen X, um, you know, and so people, um, you know, that uh, grew up a lot during, you know, the, the 70s and 80s and, and treating them all as, as the same, you know, monolithic, uh, you know, segment of people is, uh, you know, is not, uh, not, not the way to go often. And so I, I really like uh, you know, hearing your excitement about how you can learn from each other, but also like how there are differences and that that's, that's okay. Um, and so definitely very excited for future conversations with you. Um, you know, just what you're, what you're learning there and what different generations can, can teach each other, but also some of the key differences between generations that may help explain some of, some of the conflicts that, that naturally arise or some of the the issues just um, whether that was culture that happened at the time that really impacted them that other generations can't see, whether that's some of the things in current culture that people are having you know, more of a difficulty adapting to or just, um, you know, even on the childhood development side, you know, childhood, you know, psychology changing so much, you know, over the last, you know, even, you know, 15 to 20 years and just what we understand about about trauma or generational responses to, uh, you know, kind of suck it up, you know, rub some dirt in it versus like, hey, like this is you know, something big that's happened in somebody's life early on and how that might affect their, their future, um, you know, viewpoints. So uh, thank you very much uh, for that. And certainly looking to future conversations there. All right. So now we are in the rapid fire question uh, session for our listeners. This is something that we do uh, at the end of each session. These are just kind of go with your gut responses. There's no right, no wrong, just kind of responding off the top of your head to uh, some quick, you know, either fun facts or, or just, you know, uh, ideas we like to throw out to uh, to our uh, listeners uh, or to our, our interviewees, I should say. Uh, so first up uh, is what is your favorite book you're reading right now? I have multiple books going right now. <laughs> but the theme, I would say, resonates around uh, people who have followed spiritual paths and then been mm. spiritual leaders. And so mm. then they end up with an autobiography or a biography. And mm. those threads, it's pretty much every book that's out that I'm looking at or reading right now. Cool. What a, what a great thread. Spiritual paths. I like it. What is your favorite band and or song by them? Right now, I've been into Saint Motel. Mm. So my type and it's all happening, right? Is It's called It's All Happening. It's a really good song right now. For stepping Ooh. into exactly what it says, like it's all happening <laughs> right now. It's amazing, yeah. Upbeat. That does tie well with a lot of what we've been discussing. <laughs> I like that. Uh, what's one of your favorite comfort foods? Right now, it's sweet potatoes. Mmm, sweet potatoes with brown sugar, without brown sugar. I could go either way, or butter, maybe both. Butter, butter brown sugar, good combo. Mm-hmm. Um, what is, uh, the, your, your live, what does it say? Your last movie that you saw that you would recommend that others also see? Well, this is a good one because I saw the last movie I saw was everything everywhere all at once. Yes. And right after I saw it, I saw Josiah at a party and I've been, I was kind of like looking around of like, who can I tell about this movie? And Uh then I tell Josiah and he like lit up right away. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Cause I, I saw it, you know, three, three times in 36 hours, you know, back when it, when it first came out, I think it was middle, middle of last year. Um, I was like, Oh my goodness, Kayla, that's, that is a fantastic one. I do. I do enjoy everything everywhere all at once. It's a defining one. I think it's like my litmus test of, uh, do people know everything's made up and constructed? Mm. What they think about that movie is going to give me a good mm. idea. <laughs> <laughs> This will give me insight into your brain. Yeah, it's yeah. a good, yeah, litmus, good litmus test. I like that. I like that a lot. Maybe we should use that as a litmus test for future guests of the pod. <laughs> if they don't say that, you know. Um, all right. What is an ordinary snapshot from your life that brings you great joy? Mm. 
ordinary snapshot right now the uh, my condo i'm able to walk out and go to a creek that's just i don't have to get in the car which is a little unusual for where we live mm -hmm. and i just get to walk down there and explore different parts of it and leave when i want and look at the trees look at the rocks it's very simple mm -hmm. it's very ordinary and it is delightful mm, i like that I like that a lot. Very peaceful, peaceful imagery. And the final question here uh, before we wrap up is what are you most grateful for right now in your life? Hmm. Yeah, in this moment that we're doing this. Yes. I, oh, I wish I could show this video to my, <laughs> I don't know, 30 year old self to say like, look, you don't have to give up all of human development. You're actually going to do so many other things you do when you're a professor that like it continues on. You don't give it all up. It just seems like it's really scary and all that. So the idea that we are, we have this podcast that I have a wonderful co-host to do it with. It's mm. a Friday afternoon. It's beautiful. Like I get to rest and relax is like, wow, this is my life. I'm so grateful. I really like that. It sounds like, yeah, very, very grateful for where you are in life right now. And, you know, uh, telling your past self it's, it's okay. That's a great, a great note to end on today. Thank you very much for being here, fellow co-host and guest on the pod, Caitlin Foss. Thanks, Josiah.